c'est... Good, good morning, Council. Good morning, Chief Justice Ireland. May it please the Court. Uh, my name is Joe Hannafy. I uh, represent the defendant appellant, Jose Rosario, uh, for his conviction of first-degree murder uh, in September of the year 2000, uh, along with a consolidated brief for the denial of his motion for a new trial. Um, and the motion for uh, a Rule 25b2 motion uh, I have incorporated that argument in my Rule 33E discussion in my brief. Um, I would like to begin by clarifying a point with respect to the, um, the failure to give the only first prong malice instruction in respect to first degree murder. Um, the, the defense counsel had filed a pretrial motion asking for specific that specific instruction, citing Giles, um, said, I want this, the instruction that only first prong malice can be applied to first degree murder. The judge considered that issue and she allowed the motion. That was pretrial. After the evidence closed during the charge conference, the issue was, was discussed again. And it was at that time that defense counsel repeated uh, his um, request that the first prong uh, instruction be given. And he did so in an effort to, to, to persuade the court that he wanted, as defense counsel, that upon review that the prejudicial error standard would apply. It's, it's right in the record, transcript 11, page 52. Um, in fact, there were three pages of discussion on that issue, pages 51 through 53 in transcript 11, where they discussed it at some length. Um, and um, and he, he commented that it was the Giles instruction he wanted. On page 53, there's a discussion with the, the trial judge that she understood the, 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 the instruction um, and that she had, she confronted it and said, I understand what you want, I'm not going to give it. And at that point, defense counsel said, okay, so long as it's clear that that's what I want. Those were his terms. I would say that he did not specifically use the word I object, but I think that it was eminently clear what he wanted, and it was eminently clear that the judge confronted it and denied that request. And so on the basis of that, I would urge the court to recognize that it's a prejudicial error standard that has to be applied. Um, the, the, um, what we know is that the jury, after they were instructed, came back with a question and asked to be re-instructed on the difference between first degree murder and second degree murder. And in each instance, the judge failed to give the first prong instruction both times. <clears throat> now there are a couple of things that combined with that error, I, I submit, creates prejudicial error. The first being that right on the tail of that uh, first uh, degree murder instruction, right on the tails of that, came the instruction about the use of a dangerous weapon. And within that uh, uh, instruction, the judge said, a dangerous weapon is capable of, is that which is capable of causing serious injury or death. That's an invitation for them to consider, with respect to the first degree murder uh, instruction, serious injury as a form of malice. The, the the other thing, and I would submit the most important, um, is the considering those points in reference to. Um, the, in consideration of the evidence. In the Johnson case, which I cited, they were, this court was, was um, um, expressed that the evidence will determine whether there's 
harm, uh, whether it's prejudicial error or harmless error. And in, consider of the, in consideration of the evidence in this case, I would submit that it's clear that what, what, why the, the jury came back and asked to be re-instructed. It's clear why the ju why, why, defense, why defense counsel wanted the instruction. Um, and it's clear that there is a, a risk that the jury um, was sufficiently confused that they applied a, a, a lesser prong of malice. The, 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 the evidence included that both cooperating witnesses um, said that the, the shooting surprised them, that the gun was always typically used for show, that um, they didn't know what was going to happen. Now, these two individuals were part of this alleged conspiracy the whole time. Had they, and they were cooperating, had they heard anything any, in any regard about anybody in the joint venture um, expressing an intention to kill, they would have said so. And the jury heard this. The, the, the other point is that the, the shooting occurred from a distance of no less than 20 feet, at least 20 feet, and the, the, the shooter was rushed into shooting, that he had no experience in using a firearm. There's no evidence that he, that he steadied his, his shooting with, with, with his other hand as he pulled the trigger. Um, and two of the three shots missed by a wide margin. And so I would submit that, and the jury heard all of this evidence, and I submit that uh, they could and probably were confused by the, the instruction on first prong malice combined with the use of uh, um, dis defining uh, a dangerous weapon as that which is capable of causing serious injury or death. That could have been, the, 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 the second and third prong of malice could have been dissected out of, of the instructions, certainly with regard to the uh, instruction on first degree murder. Uh, the, the, it, it could have been worded such that you are permitted to infer <coughs> that a person using a dangerous weapon, you are permitted to infer that, that he did so with an intent to kill. That would, have, that would have cured the fact that there was no first prong malice instruction. And I submit that that uh, was prejudicial error and a new trial is warranted on that issue. Um, the, um, uh, I would move to the um, issue with respect to the propensity for violence issue that I um, discussed in my brief. That was the point uh, where the issue arose when, when defense, excuse me, when, when the prosecutor was allowed to elicit that, uh, <clears throat> that, um, um, he, that, that Latin kings harm or kill people in prison. Um, and I submit that, it's, that, that was pre, it was error and prejudicial error on a, for a variety of reasons. Typically, um, when a witness is reluctant to come forward um, on a, in, in a setting that let's call a don't snitch setting, where for some reason they fear retaliation by a participant in a crime, um, and so when, if they're, when they're, that witness is cross-examined, exa cross uh, on that subject, then he is, uh, the prosecutor is allowed to rehabilitate that witness by saying, I didn't come forward, I, I didn't speak sooner uh, because I, I felt uh, I would be retaliated against. What we have in, in the Rosario case is we have a, 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 a cooperating co-defendant who is being given the opportunity to talk about his fear of retaliation. And I, I submit that that's, it distinguishes it and I think it's, 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 it's error for, for a variety of reasons, one of which is in his earlier statement, he didn't, first of all, he didn't, R Rivera didn't, didn't withhold information for fear of retaliation. He was the first person to come forward, and he did so because it was a, he gave a self-serving statement. Fear had nothing to do with it. When it came time for trial, he had by that time become a cooperating witness. And certainly to say that he should be allowed to talk about his fear of prison killing is somehow relevant to his 
coming forward and testifying is, is it's totally irrelevant. Do you think this was in completely inappropriate, even if it was to establish credibility? Yes, because I, I do, uh, Justice Duffley, because what, what, what's happening is, and it's very subtle, what's happening is, is that the, the prosecutor, prosecution is, is, is trying to suggest that, he, that, that he's testifying because he's in fear. That's not the case. He's testifying despite the fear. He's testifying because he's hoping to get a, a good deal, not because he's in fear. It has nothing to do with, with his credibility. It has nothing to do with his, his, his um, a bias in favor of testifying truthfully. It has nothing to do with his bias in favor of testifying falsely. It's just not relevant. But what, and it's further compounded because what it becomes is a form of vouching. And that is that... Uh, you're not concerned that it has to do with gang violence or their uh, relationship to a gang because there were voir dire questions about that or instructions. Well, no, that, that, well, there, was, there were voir dire questions about that, but what I'm saying is that the, the allowance of this highly prejudicial evidence into the case harmed the defense because... Prejudicial because it related to gang, potential gang violence and gang membership? Well, yes, because gang, gang uh, affiliation, gang activity, is only very limited. It can only be introduced in a very limited way, and, in the, in, and then only if it has to do with the, the defendant's motive, not the, a cooperating co-defendant's motive. And so it was, it was error on that, on that basis. But in terms of the vouching component of it, uh, key, the Kiamp case tells us that, that a prosecutor is not allowed to share with, with the, the, the jury uh, uh, by way of uh, examining her witness that she sympathizes with the fear being felt by her witness because that suggests that she knows he's in danger, that's why he's telling the truth, and Kiampa says you can't do that. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And, and it was objected to uh, vigorously. Now, this is on, on, on the heels, or I should say, in addition to what occurred at trial, which I would like to call uh, a case of hyper-vouching, where uh, there were numerous instances where the defense, where the prosecutor, although she was allowed to um, lead the witness to avoid it, her, fir her, her first cooperating um, witness uh, she elicited from him on direct examination that he was there only to speak the truth. It was objected to, a, a, an incomplete camper instruction was given, and then in her next, um, with the next witness, she elicits from him, what did I want you to do, and he says to tell the truth, and then that's followed up by her repeat of that question, um, what did I tell you to do, and the witness says the truth, and then she says, what do you mean by that? And he says, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, so the, 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 the whole case was, was permeated with this notion that the truth is being, being fed to the jury. Um, didn't the judge immediately afterwards issue the curative instruction? You said it was incomplete. It, it was incomplete. Okay. She didn't talk about that the, the, the Commonwealth doesn't have any, this was during the trial, not in closing, or not in final instructions, but she said that she didn't say anything about the, the prosecutor does not have any way of knowing what, whether the, the witness is telling the truth. That's the essence of, of what I would submit was made it incomplete because that was the time to clarify it. But, but she did say that at the end of the trial. She did. But she didn't completely go all the way with, with um, uh, making it clear that uh, the, the witnesses coming forward um, uh, should not be used to uh, suggest that, 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 um, um, that he's speaking the truth or that the Commonwealth has any way of knowing that he's speaking the truth. The, the, the other point is that in, in closing, the, the prosecutor went back into this whole arena of, of speaking the truth, or I know the truth, when she said to the jury, uh, the defense counsel doesn't want you to look for the truth, and then uh, said, this is what happened, and uh, um, 
it just fed the, the, the whole sense that, that, that uh, she knew it was the truth, her witnesses were in fear, and therefore it, you can trust that this is the truth. Um, and I submit that it was, it was prejudicial error and um, um, a new trial is warranted on that ground. The, the, um, um, I would like to go briefly to the question of the frightened juror issue. Um, and I say frightened juror because um, this witness, we know that she was frightened because she came forward uh, with her concern to, I think it was first to a court officer who then immediately made it known to the court and they brought her in and she said, uh, you know, she was embarrassed that this is, she got to this point with, with the, the, um, the issue. Um, and then in, in, um, in the sidebar discussion, the courtroom had not been cleared at that point, um, there's a sidebar and um, the judge asks the witness to describe who she thought she saw and she didn't want to do it. She said, do I really have to? This is on page nine of transcript number nine. She says, do I really have to? And clearly she was telling the judge she's afraid because the judge says, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll close the courtroom. And so she closed the courtroom. And when everybody went out, that's when the judge said to the, to the, to the juror, um, um, cause she was in, in sidebar with, with counsel and the judge, uh, to defense counsel, isn't that, isn't that a family member or isn't that a friend or family member of, of the defendant? And defense counsel answered her question and said yes. Now, I don't, I submit that she did, that didn't have to be made known to the juror, and yet it was. And, and I, I take issue with this because the, in, in the Commonwealth brief, they suggest that this woman wasn't afraid. And, and I submit that she was, and that's pretty apparent. And she told other jurors, and yes, that they, they were, they were voir dired, but gang violence permeated the courtroom. And I submit that, that it was error not to uh, discharge that juror, which the defense counsel had asked to be done. But I, I, I submit that, it, that, a, that a, uh, a lesser degree of, 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 of remedy uh, uh, could have occurred, and that is to make that that juror an alternate. There were four alternates at the end of the trial. And, and there, I cited a case, the name escapes me at the moment, but the, the issue in that case was that um, th there was a, um, a, a juror that was fearful and, and it was cured because that juror was made an alternate. And, and that didn't happen in this case. Um, the, um, um, I would also now like to discuss briefly the um, the issue involving, which occurred in, in the motion for new trial, the issue arose at trial, the, 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 um, the Luis Rodriguez cooperation agreement. Um, and I submit that a lot was going on with that issue, and, and, and including the fact that I submit that the, that the district attorney uh, took an untenable position with respect to the, um, uh, the cooperation agreement that they struck with Rodriguez because they were concerned that it was going to impact on the Rivas conviction, which was, who was a co-defendant, was convicted of first degree murder uh, about a month earlier. And there too, the cooperation agreement with Rodriguez was never brought out. And that's what they were concerned about. Not Rosario's trial rights, or not Rosario's rights, but let's not muck up the Rivas case. And, and I submit that the judge took, was, was also concerned about that. In fact, as soon as the issue arose, the first thing that the judge said was, did he, this man testify in the Rivas trial? And I submit that everything that followed that um, was born of that concern. And I say it was an untenable position, and I say, and I submit that that was not, that is not an, uh, uh, an overstatement. Um, the um, defense counsel asked several things of the judge when it became known. They did a, they did a, a voir dire of, of both uh, Mr. Rodriguez and his attorney, um, Edward Fogarty, 
and they were clear that, that, that a, a cooperation agreement had been uh, uh, posited after a lengthy period of time when a witness wasn't cooperating. In, in the motion for a new trial, the, tr the trial judge, or excuse me, the trial prosecutor acknowledged that in, in those situations, it's, it's not untypical to offer a cooperation agreement. That's why they're available. But, um, but defense counsel wanted it known, wanted the jury to know that he didn't know about it until after he, he uh, finished his cross-examination with Rodriguez. I submit it's because he didn't want to look desperate in the eyes of the jury. Uh, and he wanted to be able to do so without feeling rushed and without <clears throat> feeling like the prosecutor might somehow uh, 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 bring in the fact that they dispute that there was an agreement Mr. through, Mr. through the fact that there was no... Mr. Hanafee, uh, sorry, I have to cut you off. Your time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It went quickly, and I would ask to uh, consider my brief, and I rest on my brief. Thank, thank you very much. May it please the court, Catherine McMahon, Assistant District Attorney for the Hamden District for the Commonwealth. First, the trial judge correctly instructed the jury on malice that it applies to deliberate premeditation. She followed the model homicide instructions and she gave only the first prong. She did not use the word prong. She said when she had denied the defendant's request to talk about the second and third prongs that she thought that was confusing. She said malice for first for deliberate premeditation is an intent to cause death. And she told the jury that the jury could infer malice for first degree murder um, from the intentional use of a dangerous weapon. The case was also submitted to the jury on second degree murder. And that she followed the model jury instructions and defined malice under all three prongs for the jury, and again said that malice could be inferred based on the intentional use of a dangerous weapon. She never um, misstated, never gave all three prongs when she was defining deliberate premeditation. She made it clear both in her general instructions and in her later instructions in response to a jury question that malice for deliberate premeditation is an intent to cause death. And I have cited in my brief at least three cases. Um, Smith was from 2010, Garcia and Guy, in which defendants raised similar challenges to this. And this court has said, in effect, that the statement that you can infer malice from the intentional use of dangerous weapon, when it's in the context of deliberate premeditation, or it's been correctly defined as an intent to cause death is, you can infer the intent to cause death from the intentional use of a dangerous weapon. It doesn't drag up the other two prongs. The judge was very clear here, deliberate premeditation, it's intent to cause death, um, second degree murder, all three prongs. It was absolutely correct. Um, and, and complete, and uh, the court doesn't have to decide what standard of error applies here because there was absolutely no error on that point. Um, as to the question of uh, the two cooperating co-defendants' concern about jail retaliation, the defense had presented a witness who had been in a lockup in the courthouse, and he alleged that he had been there with some of the co-defendants, and he heard them um, conspiring to um, falsely implicate this defendant. In closing, in volume 12 at pages 43 and 44, the trial prosecutor used their um, fear of retaliation to argue if they're concerned about being retaliated against in jail, why would they concoct like a plot to um, falsely implicate a co-defendant in front of other jail inmates? Um, so that is how she used it. She didn't use it as they were fearful, ergo they are truthful. She used it to rebut defendant's testimony. Um, she did, in examining the witnesses about the cooperation agreement, she did err with the first cooperating co-defendant by bringing out the requirement of truthfulness on direct. There was an immediate objection, and the trial judge told the jury to, at that point to disregard any reference to truthful testimony and told the jury that they were the only people who could determine what was truthful. In her main charge, the trial judge followed Champa and told the jury to examine both cooperating co-defendants' testimony with great care and caution. 
told the jury that the government had no ability to determine whether or not they were truthful, and the determination about whether they were truthful or not was something exclusively within the jury's province. So um, if the references to truthfulness can at all be considered vouching, um, and I submit they were not, the trial judge's very thorough following of the law about Champa cured any possible error and directed the jury to exactly how they were supposed to examine those witnesses' testimony. Um, in terms of Mr. Rodriguez, um, one of the witnesses who had been in the apartment and observed a telephone conversation between the defendant and um, the best friend of the murder victim, there was no cooperating agreement with that witness. After um, a three-day motion hearing on the defendant's motion for new trial, the trial judge found that there was no cooperation agreement between Rodriguez and um, the Commonwealth. At trial, this arose in the midst of the trial, where after Rodriguez had completed his testimony, I think the trial prosecutor that night received an email or some kind of message from Rodriguez's attorney saying, you know, now what, now that he's cooperated. And she had a second prosecutor um, assist her in trying to flesh that out, and it's the second prosecutor who addressed the trial judge, in this case, in the middle of the trial. The concern here was and it's, it's a lengthy um, sidebar, as well as a voir dire of Rodriguez and his attorney, Attorney Fogarty. The focus here was what to do in this case about this witness's belief, whether it was credible or not, his belief that he had a cooperating agreement with the Commonwealth. The way this was handled was not because of concern about a case that had already been tried. That was a different problem that the Commonwealth had. But here, the Commonwealth offered, defense counsel didn't want to be the one to call Rodriguez back and put him on the stand. He suggested that the jury would blame him for um, chopping up the case that way. The case had already been chopped up when the Commonwealth had interrupted the testimony of a witness to bring this problem to the trial judge's attention. So there was already a break, and the Commonwealth repeatedly offered to put Mr. Rodriguez on the stand and have Mr. Rodriguez testify that he believed he had a cooperation agreement with the Commonwealth, period. The Commonwealth wasn't going to challenge that brief belief, but put that before the jury, because as the assisting prosecutor noted, what was important was what was in that witness's head when he testified, if he thought he had a cooperation agreement um, and for the jury to assess whether he might have some bias. The defense wanted to also put on either that prosecutor, the trial prosecutor, a police officer, or get a stipulation from the Commonwealth that he was only told of the agreement like the, the, the previous evening. The Commonwealth disputed that there was a cooperation agreement. The trial judge at that point did not find that there was a cooperation agreement, and indeed after the motion for a new trial was concluded, she found that there was not. And she can control the juries being bogged down with um, collateral issues as to whether the agreement was real or not. The trial judge found that the defendants, or any prejudice to the defendant would be sufficiently cured by presenting the fact that the witness believed he had a cooperation agreement to the jury. And that's how the jury would use it. You would use the fact of a cooperation agreement to assess credibility. That's exactly what the judge had told the jury when she instructed them about the two cooperating co-defendants, that you look, look with care and caution. And um, finally, she found in the denial of the motion for new, new trial that Rodriguez was not a significant witness for the Commonwealth. He, just as the best friend of the victim and one of the women in the apartment before, while the defendant was there, heard in the telephone conversation between the defendant and the best friend of the victim that the defendant said, I am your worst nightmare. He wasn't the only witness to that. There were three witnesses to that, so he was cumulative on that score. He did um, testify as to the passage of the vehicle that the defendant and his co-defendants supposedly arrived on the scene with and drove around coming in with the lights off, leaving with the lights on. Um, his <coughs> description of the path of the vehicle and the lights on or off was inconsistent with one of the cooperating co-defendants. Defense counsel used Rodriguez's 
description of the vehicle's passage to challenge the credibility of one of the two main witnesses in the Commonwealth's case. I admit that at the outset of the cross-examination of this witness, defense counsel started off by impeaching this witness with his um, prior record. And then he did go into inconsistencies between statements in his police report and some of the statements on the stand. But he used the witness both in his cross-examination and in his closing argument to point out differences between his testimony and that of one of the um, cooperating co-defendants who he vigorously, whose vig credibility he vigorously attacked. And he also used this witness who was present and standing with the victim when the victim was shot to um, suggest that the gunshot that killed the victim did not come from the site where this defendant, the shooter, and another co-defendant were standing, but to support testimony that it was a drive-by shooting that another vehicle had passed by and that because the, the victim was shot in the right side of his head and where this witness said the victim was facing, that the shot did not come from the park where the defendants were supposedly were, but probably came from the street. And there was um, a neighbor in this apartment building who had heard um, words exchanged between people in a car and a person standing on the street, and she heard gunshots. And that also supported the defense theory that the gunshot did not come from the area where the co-defendants allegedly were, but came from like a drive-by car. So in this respect, this witness was helpful to the defense and he did not um, challenge his credibility in his closing argument, but he picked out certain things from his testimony in order to support um, his theory of the case and to attack the credibility of the co-defendants um, who were like the central witnesses for the Commonwealth. Um, unless the court has further questions on the other issues, I'll rest on my brief. Thank you, counsel.